Okay. Hey. This is live. This is We're live. live. Boop, boop, live. boop. All right. We are on the internet and again, accidentally, at the same time, every week. Thank you for being here. This is my friend Thank Normal. You. Hello. We're going to have a jam packed show. You might even not yes. know all the things because Super we didn't exciting. even. We didn't even list all the things that we're going to talk about, but we're excited because we got our friend Dan here. So let's get mm -hmm. to it. This is normal. I'm Brett. This is our show. We do this every week. It turns into a podcast. You can listen to us, put knowledge in your ear with our smart guests that come in to teach us yes. stuff because that's my secret is that I don't really know everything. So I bring other people on to make me sound smart. Um, so we have this podcast and then you can listen to that. It's on all the best podcast players, except Google, because they shut theirs down because they're Google. Um, <laughs> and they like to ruin everyone's day. We also have a newsletter that Nermal loves this to talk is where, about. Yeah, this is where you find out about this show, uh, the shows and, and also um, other news items that uh, Brett talks about and coincidentally maybe maybe coincidentally and this week. there's one from yesterday yeah about <laughs> a topic that we will definitely be talking about today on, on today's show which is the the recent xz backdoor um um kerfuffle. I guess, vulnerability kerfuffle? kerfuffle oh yeah that's a solid word uh kerfuffle turns out security week. is not solved so yeah <laughs> Shocker. Um, <laughs> but yes, uh, so check out the newsletter. That's what you'll find out about the this show, uh, future guests, uh, what topics we're covering, what's happening in the in the industry and DevOps and Cloud Native and Docker and all the things that we're doing on this show. So check out that. Where where can what's that at? Brett.news? Is that right? News and, yes. uh, and, and Discord. Like, Discord's above us. I don't need to show you what Discord looks like. Yes. It's all of our friends. It's where we chat and talk about the the latest fads in DevOps and security and everything cloud native. So, uh, and also memes and games. Like, we have to obviously yep. talk about games. And then someone recently requested a movies channel. So, we're Ooh. basically a subreddit of subreddits uh, inside of a live chat app. I don't know how to describe yes. it, but we have 17,000 people there. So, you should show up because that's where the. Yeah. That's where our friends hang out. And you're our friends, right? Like you're, you're here yes. watching. So come check this out. And also one last oh, announcement. One last. Um, oh, that's right. I'm the yeah, one DevOps it. days. DevOps days RDU Raleigh is back in 2024. It's happening next week. So oh um, please check that out. I know. I know where we've got a great lineup of speakers. Um, uh, folks like my awesome colleague, Carlos Santana is going to be speaking at DevOps days in the Raleigh area. Uh, that's next wednesday and thursday so that's april 10th and 11th in raleigh uh i'll be there so if you're attending um come say hello and if not come check out the website register if you're in the area i'd love to see you there and with that note we've got so much to cover today in today's show right <laughs> right brett i mean we're just like brimming with we're, topics. We're, we can't wait. So we're going to get into it. No, no more announcements. Like th this, yes. that was the, that was the last of the announcements. There's other things we could talk about, but we wanted to bring in Dan Lawrence, our friend of the show. Thanks so much for having me on. <laughs> Glad Thanks to have you back. Here. Yeah. And I swear we didn't time this. I swear that we've been planning this for months and that you were planning the XZ vulnerability for months. Yes. Is that what you're saying? Yes, for months. <laughs> uh, so so that was all planned so that when Dan was on the show, he would have a hot topic that would make us all stop totally. and think about security for a minute. Totally. So here we are. So, right, so um, get, think about. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Dan, Dan who, who are you? <laughs> Can you describe who you are first real quick? <laughs> uh, yes, my name is Dan Lawrence. I'm uh, the co-founder and CEO of a software supply chain security company named ChainGuard. Uh, before that, I worked at Google for about 10 years, uh, a lot of that time on stuff like Salsa and SigStore and build system security and open source backdoors and all of these other fun topics. So it really feels like uh, the perfect day to have me on, even though we did not plan this. I'm just going to say that one more time. We did not plan this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, I can't we think of a We couldn't possibly person. have planned this. We didn't, yeah. we didn't know until, was it Saturday when the, yeah. when the Ma Mastodon post came out? Okay. Uh, yeah, but... That being said, I don't think we can think of a better person to yeah. talk about what just happened this past week. And um, who wants to take on the primer? What what happened this past week? What's what's XZ? 
besides two letters of the alphabet. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure there are some better people out there, but no, I, I've been yeah. worried about this exact thing happening for years, um, and it finally happened. Uh, well, finally happened that we know of, I guess, is, is the way I put it. I'm sure this has happened before, and it'll probably happen again. Um, but this is a, this was a, a really terrifying software supply chain attack, um, and it falls into the most terrifying case, which is the one that uh, we're so ill-prepared for as an industry, um, where somebody patiently, um, very, very patiently, Patiently, um, spent multiple years uh, working with a maintainer of a tiny low-level open source project that's distributed roughly everywhere uh, to eventually build up trust by doing useful, good work, helping out on all of those maintenance tasks that happen in every open source project, um, and eventually got promoted to being the maintainer of the project. Um, and then over the next year, the other sole maintainer that had been working on this for a decade by himself basically uh, stepped back. And so in the course of two years, this bad nation state most likely actor uh, took over a project uh, the complete normal way open source works. Uh, new people right. come, they help out, they yeah. get promoted in the project. That's a good thing. That happens all the time. Um, yeah. But uh, when you're dealing in open source, um, the realization is that anybody on the internet can contribute. And that's great. Um, unless you've spent more than 10 minutes on the internet and realize how terrible some of the people on the internet are. Um, and, you know, then, uh, you know, it, it escalated from there over the next six months. Uh, they carefully hid a whole series of backdoors in ways that were completely indistinguishable, hard to notice, um, and then finally triggered uh, what turned into an attack over the last couple of weeks, injecting a backdoor into something that used XZ, um, the SSH tool. Um, the SSH tool runs on pretty much every server, and it's how you log in and administer them. Um, it has root access on almost any Linux machine running on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, and this backdoor was set up in a way to give a very specific person, right? Not like uh, Log4j style, anybody can start sending payloads everywhere. It was cryptographically signed. That's how sophisticated this was. Only the person that had the private key would be able to log in, but they could log into anything running SSH. Um, this got caught by pure luck, basically. Um, you know, the, the saying in open source is many eyes make all bugs shallow. So I think, you know, some of that played in. So many people are looking at these things. But the person that found it uh, wasn't looking for it. Um, he was doing something completely unrelated and saw that SSH was taking up a bit more CPU than he expected mm -hmm. it to. Um, and he also happened to be a really good reverse engineer and happened to not have to run to a meeting or something two minutes after that and forget about it. Uh, he spent the next couple of days and weeks figuring out what was going on and found what I'm hoping what I'm assuming he hoped he was not going to find. Uh, malicious code injected in there. Um, it got published and disclosed and investigated and all weekend. And even still today, people are trying to reverse engineer the actual exploit to figure out what it could do and how it was built. Um, but yeah, most people are safe now. Um, it was on the verge of getting rolled out to like major Linux distros like Debian and Fedora and Ubuntu. Uh, it was really caught right at the last minute. Um, we as an industry, uh, we as a country, we as a world, we're very, very lucky with the timing here. Yeah. Yeah. There's like so many I, things that had to happen just <laughs> right yes. for this to actually be found, discovered, uh, before it was sort of yeah, like and, everywhere. <laughs> and, um, just, just to like emphasize the point you're making, uh, you kind of mentioned right at the beginning that you you've been waiting for something like this. Um, like this is kind of core to some of the work that you're doing with ChainGuard and what what the purpose yeah. of ChainGuard is, um, and 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 some of the mission that your 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 uh, company is kind of tackling. But also, I, I want to kind of highlight. I, I've I posted in the timeline, and I think there's people making yeah. graphics of kind of the complaint and it's I, i've been reading a lot about this and it's it's a pretty complex yeah <laughs> uh yeah uh timeline and it's also a pretty complex piece of uh, vulnerability or backdoor that was put in place um but also there's an intersection with um you know uh the maintainer mental health these uh singular voluntary open source project maintainers that are out there uh you know d doing the best they can on their free time, and um, there was an intersection with mental health, with with the with how we're responding as a community to open source projects, and that's been an ongoing yeah. debate for the last like four years. And yeah. this seems like a perfect uh, use case that everyone has been kind of waiting for this cross section between all these hot topics, right? And now it's like kind of come to light, um, and and and. and, and it, one thing I'm worried about is like this was found. How many other things are happening right now across like 
so many other small open source projects uh, yeah. right now that we're not even discovering, yeah. right? And so um, to kind of yeah, circle well, like... back, what, what's, what's your uh, kind of going back to the, the last thing you said around the distribution, right? It was about to be distributed. Um, you at ChainGuard are are intimately involved with the packaging, yeah. uh, you know, creating your own distro, packaging of of these um, pieces of software. Um, what's your take, and what what's the intersection between yeah. what you're doing at ChainGuard and and something like this? Because I I don't see a very clear line between all the security software and vulnerability scanning tools and everything out there. Whether this would have actually been caught or like how does what's the take, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, all supply chain security attacks are like, they're really complicated because there's so many moving parts in them and there's so many holes to pick apart and so many gaps to fill. And there's no magic answer for stuff like this. Um, you said, I've been waiting for this. I, I wouldn't frame it that way. I've been hoping this never happened, but expecting it to uh, pessimistic course, yeah. and realistically for years. Um, but yeah, like that threat model of like somebody could just uh, you know, we're really good at detecting um, accidental vulnerabilities now. There's fuzzing and there's all this fun AI stuff now to look for those kind of bugs and SAS and DAS tools and scanners to help you find known vulnerabilities. Um, but even when you secure the whole supply chain end to end, all you've done is build a secure malware distribution system if somebody is shipping you malware from the start. <laughs> um, and right. so, like, there, there's no real, if you look at it with that threat model of, like, the person on the other end uh, ships malware on purpose, then... There's no real prevention industry wide or anywhere for this. Um, that doesn't mean we're completely hopeless, right? People catch these things. You can still do network monitoring if somebody were to attack you. And it, like it's classic defense in depth. So there's just a whole bunch of systems in place, but there's no magic answer for this stuff. Um, you touched on like the open source maintainer stuff where people are doing this in their spare time. That's a problem. There's social engineering like that went into play here. Um, but as a high level, at a high level, like the, the main thing I want to call out is um, like there's been some like stupid takes on Twitter, all these places like open source is insecure because this stuff happens. Um, the same thing happens inside of companies too, right? Like it, and, uh, this was caught and reverse engineered and remediated so quickly because it's open source, right? Yeah. Um, open source is still way more secure. I'll go down, uh, go on record every time saying that um, this same thing happens inside of companies and it never gets caught. Um, like you won't have access to the source code. You, uh, the reverse engineer wouldn't have been able to find the payload where it got injected. Right. Um, none of this would have happened if this was closed source software. And this happens constantly in those environments. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's so many gaps. We can dive into each one of them, but yeah, at a high level, like open source is more secure. We can't stop using open source. Open source right. will keep getting better and it's going to get harder the next time someone does this. It's not going to get impossible, but that's how security works in general. All we can do is raise the bar the next time somebody tries this. I feel like yeah, when you when you look at this scenario, it's it's the best of the internet. It's the like obviously the worst of the internet is what snuck the file in, yeah. and like the best of the internet is what discovered it. And when you privatize that, you you make it now. Well, it's the best and the worst of what that company can do, but none of us have any awareness. And and we've all like we've all been around long enough to know that like I remember the time when Microsoft first shipped their own private sourced SS you know SSHD for Windows. And if that performance, because that's what this all started as, right? It's like a Microsoft, re uh, I don't even know if he's actually a researcher, but he just sort of was like, hey, SSH is slower now. That's weird. I'm doing some benchmark or testing or whatever. And, yeah. and if that had happened with commercial software that we all think of as private source and like comes out of someone like Microsoft, we would have just thought, well, you know, things get slower, faster over time. That's totally normal as versions happen. And... That's why sometimes they announce like as a feature, we're making it faster again. Uh, <laughs> is it gets has to get slow first, and yeah. so things would get slow, and we would it would have taken maybe years, or if it, it was ever discovered, it would have had to been that company deciding to announce their vulnerability, and we would all been uh, sort of you know for the last two years this demon has been on all these servers on the internet, and like you said, it probably could have been someone noticing weird SSH connections attempts from places that they shouldn't be coming from if they were savvy enough to actually monitor for that kind of thing. Um, it's just, it does ring of a lot of, you know, we told you so nightmare scenarios, but, uh, one of the things that kind of stuck out to me that I wanted to, cause we could talk about this for the whole hour, right? But we're sure. not really a news show. And so if you're all, if you're all wanting more information on like which versions were affected, uh, you know, if you're, if you weren't running beta or very, very early, uh, edge versions of things like Debian and Fedora, you're, you're fine. Um, in fact, I remember reading that, uh, Ubuntu, cause Ubuntu, 
2404 is about to get released uh, because we've all been waiting for that. Right. It, it is a, it is the month they decide to do that. And they, they decided to, uh, because of this, normal you were mentioning earlier, like they decided to rebuild all binaries mm-hmm. and it was going to take an extra week because they had to rebuild every binary to be just extra sure that they didn't include these particular files or the 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 changes to the SSHD and whatnot. And uh, I wanted to inter- intersect this to what you all are doing in in the supply chain. So I remember when you you were last on, which seemed like an eternity ago. It was like a year when and a half that? ago. Yeah, it was yeah. a year and a half ago. It was a long time. <laughs> yeah. And we were so excited to talk about at the time it was Wolfie images. Now they're chain guard images, but it's essentially the same thing. And you were talking about the idea that you all, you were sort of like an undistro or a container only distro okay. and that you were building everything yourself to just be absolutely sure that you that you knew what you were using, that you weren't just pulling random binaries from all over the internet. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that well, as we lean into the chain guard image t- topic? Yeah, and I'll use some of the XE stuff to kind of explain it a little bit. Um, yeah. yeah, so start, uh, just so we don't completely move away from that topic because I can't stop talking about it anyway. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, starting with containers, right? Uh, in the last you know decade, containers have taken over software. It's this awesome form factor that I'm sure your show and everyone watching knows about, but um, it's a uniform form factor everyone can use now to build and ship any type of software, any packages, any language, get it running anywhere. Um, they've really flattened the playing field that way, and everyone is using containers now which is awesome. Um, But containers, from the supply chain perspective, they sit at the very end. Um, You can build containers securely, you can sign containers and all of that stuff, but through no fault of their own, they inherit the problems of all of the other build tools that people use to build stuff into containers. Um, If you look at a Docker file, um, they they have a from line, and then they have a bunch of package manager commands inside of them normally. Um, And so Docker uh, and Docker files inherit the problems of all of those other package managers and the way that they operate uh, because Docker is kind of that final assembly unit. So even if you're building containers securely, you just move up a link to the supply chain um, and there's a lot mm-hmm. of gaps there. Um, and in particular, there's this one really important gap that a lot of folks don't realize and I've talked about it a bunch and there's a lot of techniques to verify it or to help improve it. But um, open source is developed in Git, but basically other source control systems exist, but the vast majority of it's on Git or GitHub or one of these other systems. Um, And it's great because you can inspect the code, you can look at it to see what's in there. Um, If you wanted to, you could review line by line and look for stuff like malware. Uh, But then when you go to the next step and you run, uh, say you were doing this for a Python library and your team audited every single line, which first of all, no one does, but uh, pretending you did that, um, the very next thing your developers do is they run pip install foo, the name of that package. Um, When you run pip install foo, you get that package from PyPI, uh, which is the Python package manager. Um, there is no link or verifiable guarantee or any way to be sure that what you installed actually came from that source code you just spent all of that time reviewing. Um, it's this huge gap in the supply chain, and that was actually used here in the XZ attack. Um, the XZ source code on GitHub had some of the malware fragments hidden inside of it, but the final activation um, happened in that step. Now, malware uh, XZ is not a Python package. It's not a Java package. Um, it's distributed in source form, but that source form here is a, a tarball, basically. Um, a lot of older uh, tools like this, uh, particularly low level in the stack, um, when people build from source, they're not really building from the Git source. They're building from this other folder that the maintainer uh, packages up themselves and uploads to all of these distro sites. Um, the final activation of this uh, attack was placed there. Um, it was hidden in that uh, source upload, the source distribution. It was not actually present in the Git repo. So if you audited the Git repo, you wouldn't have found it. Um, and that link is a really critical one. Um, there are technologies like Salsa and SigStore and a whole bunch of other ways to sign and make that link more verifiable. There's reproducible builds so somebody else could run that same step and make sure they got the same byte for byte output. Um, but that's not that common that low in the stack. No. Um, but uh, when we're trying to build our product, our chain guard images product and connecting it all back to this, um, we're starting all the way over there. We're grabbing these source code packages and we're trying to build them as securely as possible and tighten up all of those links um, so that we can deliver that final unit, the Docker file, the Docker image as securely as we can, but by securing all of those other links in the process. Right. Um, for this XZ attack, uh, the person uploaded that file to the website and that's what most people were using to build. 
um, in our distro where we okay. build everything from source ourselves, like we talked about, um, in almost every case, we prefer getting it directly from the Git repository. We can pin the commit. All of that is auditable. There's no chance mm -hmm. that someone can tamper with it. Um, we weren't affected by this, but mostly by luck, to be honest, uh, because this was targeted at a couple of specific Linux distributions, and we didn't happen to be one of those. Um, in this case, we did actually get it from the source upload. Um, because of this nasty cycle cyclic dependency, this thing is so low level in the stack that Git depends yeah. on XC. And so we can't use Git to fetch the XC source because you have to get XC oh. before you can even build Git. And we have this ability to rebootstrap everything from scratch, just like we might do in all these other distros. But we do have a handful of exceptions there where we're not using Git because we can't because that thing is a dependency of Git. We're working on a bunch of ways to make a whole separate bootstrap set of packages so we can tighten that up even further as a result here. Um, but those links wow. happen at every stage in the pipeline. Um, that's how like low level and scary this one was. I remember yeah, that you all worked really hard crazy. on... <laughs> yeah, I remember you all were, were working really hard and making some news last year around just being able to build Go from source and the, yeah. the interdependencies of that. And, yeah. you know, it's one of those things where it's like, if you're building everything, the build tools are probably the most important thing to get right first before you start building a thousand other things. Exactly. But also <laughs> those build tools have their own dependencies that are so complex that it's like... It, it's like the first principles assumptions of yeah. well I have a I have a CPU and I trust the hardware that there's no chip in there that I didn't expect but other than that yeah. what else do I need to be sure about before I start building and it, it turns out it it's harder than I can imagine. And so I'm actually really appreciative mm -hmm. of how much effort and then transparency you all put. In. If, for those of you out there on the internet, if you can't tell, I'm a fan of Chain Guard. So uh, <laughs> that's why we have you back on the show because this stuff is hard and it you don't just like one blog post deciphering all this stuff isn't going to make its rounds. And I, th and I love that you all put in conference talks and videos and blog posts, just slowly over time, helping those that are, are even just slightly interested figure out, Oh, this is how this stuff works. It was all just done for me, right? Ubuntu. We don't normally go read the Debian log on how they built the latest Debian image or whatever. And, uh, or, you know, server OS. And I think it's, it's one of those things where, again, we're all so high up in the stack that we all assume that the, someone else is taking care of the lower stuff in the stack, or I guess you could uh, higher up in the stack, I guess you could say. Uh, so for the images here, I was actually gonna ask you, then you already answered that question. Like you didn't, it, it wasn't something that you needed to worry about because you were fetching upstream, but again, like this was just a different vector that they had approached instead of actually trying to put right. a, a couple of files upstream. Um, do you you also have another big announcement and we're going to I'm going to pivot again cuz I want to make sure we get all this stuff in. Uh we were excited actually Nermal and I both was it 2 weeks ago Nermal that we we picked two, our fa our our news two announcement. 2 weeks ago was KubeCon. 2 two okay, weeks three ago weeks. was KubeCon so it's like 3 weeks ago. 3 <laughs> weeks ago. We yes. both came with a single news item that we were going we wanted to mention on the show and both of us picked Chain Guard is Chain Guard images are now in Docker Hub as our mm -hmm. thing separately. And so we came on the show and we were both excited about it. What is for those that are interested in switching their base images or they've done things like switch to Alpine and now I'm telling them, "Hey, you might want to also check out Chain Guard. Like it's pretty dope." Uh mm -hmm as good as like all the other things combined without all the negative effects of a lot of those things combined. What does this announcement really mean on for sure. being available in Docker Hub? Sure, yeah, so our images have been available for a long time. We have our own registry that they, they've been hosting on historically, and I'll talk about some of that history. Um, you know, we, we have a whole set of images that they're based on the Wolfie Linux Undistro, which is what we call it. Um, it's a, a fun naming thing, but uh, because it's containers, we build all of the packages uh, for containers. Um, there's no kernel in containers, so there's no Linux, so we can't really call them a Linux distro. Um, Un-Linux distro sounds sillier than Linux Undistro, so we go with Undistro. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we've had these for a long time. The Wolfie project is open source. You can look at the GitHub repo. We keep all of the packages in there. Um, we update them all constantly. Um, we uh, it, It's basically an open source project, but we're also a business, and we have to figure out how we're going to make money, too, at the same time. Um, and, and the model there is that uh, the latest version of everything that's in Wolfie, the latest version is usually the most secure. It has all the stuff with all the vulnerabilities patched anyway. Um, that goes into Wolfie. Um, you can get that for free uh, from <clears throat> our free tier of chain guard images. They're called the developer tier. You can see that up here. Uh, but we also have a lot of older versions for projects that support older versions, and uh, we do that work too, which is a lot harder. We have to backport CV patches sometimes. Uh, it's uh, Most distros stick to one version, um, but because of the way we build and the way we do our bootstrapping and everything, we can support multiple versions of things. So we have every version of Python that's supported, which is like you know five or six versions. Um, and so the kind of 
free to paid model is uh, when Python 3.13 comes out, the free tier moves to 3.13. Um, you might like that if you're an open source project or uh, somebody playing around, you, you get an automatic update. Uh, but for enterprises, they want a little bit more stability. They want to be able to plan these things out. And that's kind of the paid model. Um, it took us a while to land on that and to get that right. Um, and so we had to build our own registry to kind of support that custom, like some people get some stuff for free, some people get some stuff for paid. Um, now that it's solid, we, we like the model, we're comfortable with it. Um, we're trying to get that free tier in as many places as we want. Um, Docker Hub is the place most people get their images from. Um, we really didn't want to have to go through something where we put stuff out and had to claw it back or anything. Um, so we thought about it for a while, we got the model right. And now we're publishing our free tier images, the, the latest version of everything on Docker Hub. Um, so it's the same images. We mirror them over. You can check the signatures if you want. You can check the digest to make sure that's not a supply chain attack as we move the stuff over. Um, but yeah, Docker Hub, it's, it's the number one source for images. Everyone uses it. Um, everyone has accounts. They can get images from there directly. Um, and that's, uh, I think we have 625 images, something like that, available today. Um, they're all getting mirrored over here. And you can see that people are grabbing them. Uh, nice, the pull stats. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, this is actually a great, uh, there's a question on on our chat from Jesse sure. Stillwell. Um, they're they're mentioning that um, uh, a question around free images versus the private registry images. Mm -hmm. uh, they're mentioning that the shahs seem to differ on the two images tagged latest in public versus private. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason for that, or is that expected, unexpected? Um, the, so, so the free tier images that are on Docker Hub and the free tier images that are on cgr.dev they should be the same byte for byte um, if you're referring to the ones that are uh the private versions of these um there's a different string in one file that says uh whether the image is wolfy or whether it's chain guard enterprise um that's used for vulnerability scanners and that's how they recognize which versions of packages are in there um that should be the only real difference but yeah that would cause a completely different sha256 so if you're referring to the private ones yeah you'll get a different hash um but for the free tier that's here and the free tier that's over there those should be the exact same if they're not cool. say something because we should look into that <laughs> yeah for sure I, awesome. I do know on that topic that we it i've seen that it's a challenge in general and i don't know and dan probably can drill into this for 20 minutes but the it has been a challenge in general to get the same image across many registries or multiple registries mm -hmm. to actually have the same from the docker tooling perspective mm -hmm. the same sha hashes just to the way that registries work and images are built and so i mm -hmm. i too struggle with like trying to make you know because a lot a lot of enterprises will pull things down and put them on their own private registry yeah. that they have because they don't have, their servers don't have internet or don't have access to pull things directly and uh, you want sort of approved escal uh, not escalation, but right. promotion type of style. And I, I've worked with teams where we're we're all wanting to verify and have the same thing everywhere so we can prove it. And it all ends up in a hot mess and we end up with a separate repo that actually does validation and comparing yeah. things. And it, I don't know if the things have gotten better, but it, it just making sure that the software getting from your GitHub to a build into an image into a server, like, that's why chain guard and these like there's an entire section of the industry that's trying to make this easier and it's still amazing how many stumbling blocks we all run into uh but this is a huge step like i feel like uh you guys talk about zero cves a lot is there is there like do, are you so confident about your images that you can look at them and say yeah we don't ship images with vulnerabilities like where does your stance lie on that whole like near zero, true zero yeah. CVEs. And obviously I don't even want to get into like, what is a CVE and which scanners are you using? And yeah. we could talk all about the NVD yeah. Yeah. problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, um, that's a very confident take, right? That's a, the absolutes and security are pretty, yeah. that takes a yeah. lot of confidence. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll explain. Um, yeah, we, yeah. Uh, so, and this is a little pet peeve of mine. I, uh, I'll, I'll dig into. Um, yeah, we don't ship images when they have CVEs, but that's not like where most of them come from. Uh, most of them come later after you've shipped an image. Um, they yeah. get found every day in versions of software. Uh, but we have tons of automation and uh, tooling and a lot of actual like just manual work uh, to go through and patch them when they're found. So we have tight SLAs um, across the board for the most part. M most images have zero CVEs almost every day we have graphs that you can show and the graphs look like they're broken most of the time because it's always at zero um but just one example so there was a cve in the go standard library that got uh reported yesterday um when that happens uh the go compiler compiles the standard library into your go program 
Um, so every time you build something with Go, that CVE is in there. Um, the scanners will flag it. That got disclosed. Uh, they send out a warning like four or five days in advance uh, when this is going to happen. Uh, automation for us picked the new Go version up in minutes. It takes you know 10 to 12 uh, minutes to build Go or something like that. Uh, but then we have like thousands of Go programs in our distro that we then have to go and rebuild. Um, we get through all of those. Uh, yesterday was our fastest one yet. We keep adding the packages, but we got through all of the Go rebuilds in something like six hours. Um, so in that six hour window, technically there was a CVE in there, but the scanners and the vulnerability days and all of those other things, they take days or weeks to actually have these things show up from the time it's disclosed. Um, yeah. And so we don't even trust those. We're using the results ourselves. We're querying all of these sources directly um, because like uh, our value proposition is zero as reported by all of your scanners, but that's not enough because the scanners miss things. And we go as far as we can to make sure that we're building it even before the scanners pick these things up. Yeah. Talking that's about awesome. like the scanner, like, a lot, a lot of the students that I work with and companies that come asking, they're usually it's usually at the beginning of their journey, or yeah. they've maybe been using containers, but now they sort of are learning yeah. to grow up and realize yeah. that they can't take supply chain for granted, and they need more than like a manual scanner that just runs in GitHub builds or something. Um, when you look, when you, I mean, I'm sure you all have worked with a lot of companies on implementing a lot of these tools. We talked about SLSA, which I'd. I would love to get to a minute to just to sure. do a plug for it. But do you have sort of like the hot take top three things that you look for when it's a very young team? They've maybe got, maybe they're doing a registry, there's registry scanning. Maybe they've got Harbor in there actually doing some things in the background, Claire or whatever. And then they've got maybe GitHub doing a little bit of code QL where they're doing some analysis of their code in addition to maybe a Trivi scan or something like that or a yeah. Docker Scout. And, but, they're, they don't really have this all connected. I'm just curious if you kind of have some big things you always look for that you feel like yeah. are the quick wins that maybe people could, you know, sure. chain guard images yeah. is maybe one, number one. <laughs> we'll get to that one last. No, there's so much you can do first. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, the first thing, um, like most of the scanners operate at the registry level because that's all you know about. If it's in the registry, that's the right. stuff you have to scan and they'll report those vulnerabilities for you. Um, but that doesn't really matter in most cases. What matters is what's running in production. Um, registries don't know what's running in production. It's not their fault. Um, it's, you know, you might have Kubernetes. You could be using Swarm. You could be running on ECS. Uh, stuff could be running in bare metal clusters that are air gapped. You don't really know from the registry's perspective. So the first one to cut down the noise, just scan what's running in production or stuff that's about to be running in production. If you're scanning everything in the registry, it's so much noise and you don't even know from looking at the tags and then the timestamps what's running in production. Mm -hmm. So there's no possible way to, um, uh, prioritize that information. Um, you could take that the next step and start deleting stuff aggressively from the registry, but that's dangerous too, because sometimes a build might fail and you might need to roll back. Or in the case of a supply chain incident like this one that was sitting around for three months, you might want to have access to those builds from three plus months ago uh, just to go do that audit. You might have data retention requirements. So you can trim down registry stuff um, like by deleting in the registry, but the biggest win first is just only scan what's running in production. Um, that saves so much, uh, so, so, so much. Um, the next one again is minimization. Um, you've talked about this a lot. You've done a bunch of testing on different image sizes. Um, yeah. Most of the CVs aren't real, right? I know we talk about CVs all the time. I'm not going to pretend most of them are real or exploitable. That's like the stats I've seen are like <laughs> only 4% maybe could get loaded. And that's like, yeah. Cool, but like when you scan one of these images, you might see a thousand, and four percent of a thousand is still forty, and then you still have to go through and look at all one thousand to figure out which four percent matters. I was gonna say, and then you have to yeah, know what I was gonna say which forty <laughs> may, 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 essentially yeah. all thousand matter until they don't, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. and so. The next one is just trim down the containers. There's smaller ones, uh, multi-stage builds help a lot there. If you need a, JD, a JDK to do build your Java app, you don't need that in the final runtime container. You know, another big uh, protection we had in place for this XD thing, um, the way it was uh, exploited was it was linked into SSH. You probably don't need SSH in your containers, but it's yeah. still there in a lot yeah. of them. Um, in fact, uh, like we coincidentally did some trimming a couple weeks ago where we noticed that Git depends on SSH. We talked about Git depending on a lot of things before, but when you pull from GitHub, that's using the SSH protocol in most cases. Yeah. Um, so I was pulling in all of SSH, but it turns out you only need the client for that, not the server. Um, and we build stuff super fine grained, so you can set it up to only pull in the mm -hmm. SSH client and not have the server sitting in your image. Techniques oh. like that. Um, so before you even start looking at the CVE list, just figure out what you can remove from the image to cut down on that noise. That's good for nice. reducing the list, but it's also good for reducing that potential attack surface. Uh, so if something is in there, somebody might find a way to use it. Even even if you're not using it live in your application. 
Um, just don't have the stuff in there you don't use. Um, then update the software. That's probably the next one. We're at what, like number three now. You asked for five. Um, five will be chain guard. I'll get to that one. Um, yeah, update everything. If you just actually rebuild and pick up updates to all of your dependencies, open source communities do great jobs here, and they fix most of these things eventually. And so if you're not updating your base image or you have a base image and you're stuck on an older one or you haven't updated the dependencies in your package JSON or something like that, try just updating those and you get through another huge chunk of them. Uh, once you've done all of that, there's going to be some stuff left, and that's the hard stuff to get rid of. Yeah, um, and that's where Chain Guard comes in. <laughs> I guess um, you know that that's kind of the extra mile we go to, where we're patching all of that stuff um, as soon as it's reported. We've kind of got our own Dependabot style set up, even for other repos. We send those patches upstream when we can. Uh, a lot of projects don't want them, so we merge those. But we try to keep the patches small and kind of time bound uh, because enterprises, even if open source communities eventually fix all of this stuff, uh, there's a lot of crazy regulatory frameworks that don't give you the mm -hmm. patience. Um, and you can't just go yell at those open mm -hmm. source maintainers to move faster. That doesn't work. That's bad. <laughs> that ties into yeah. all the sustainability yeah. and stuff like that. Um, but we do all of that work and we fix all of them and we get those fixes out there. So we keep that zero CV SLA and goal for ourselves. And Very cool. what we just learned this week is yelling at open source maintainers is an <laughs> attack vector, right? Yes. So, like, yes. <laughs> so please don't do that. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll They're going to start accusing my... you of being a nation state actor if you start doing that. <laughs> yeah. mm, wow. Right. Will we ever know the uh, the real, oh, what was their name? I can't remember the, the actor the that actually did a lot of this work on GitHub. Uh or was it Git? Was it even on GitHub? Was this a GitHub repo? No, it's like yeah, yeah. somebody's personal thing on a website. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah because it's like we, that. There was a name associated with the account, but most likely not the real person, and yeah. we probably won't ever see them do anything again, uh, unless they just want to troll their uh, under that their name. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. right, exactly. Yeah, they've probably got ten names. Who knows? Yeah, the, we'll probably yeah. Who knows if we'll discover the other ones? The um, yeah, a lot of this stuff can feel super overwhelming, and I love that you're approaching it from like big easy bank like there's there's easy and hard and there's big effects and little effects right like a lot of these security measures that we all take you know sometimes they're hard to implement and they're there's a, there's very they're, the edge cases for when they're actually a, an advantage are so edgy that you maybe d put that way down the list yeah. and i love yeah. to talk about in fact i think my talk like a year and a half ago at Sevo navigate which um was in florida la last year i tried to it was a crazy talk. I probably shouldn't have done it as big as I did, but it was like a list of the 40 things in security for containers uh, or just code in general, because a lot of times containers, you're building containers from code and images and all these things. And so you actually have to care about code. If you're someone who's just focused on Kubernetes and the images, you eventually are going to have to get involved with the code if you really care about tightening up the security of what's being shipped to your Kubernetes. And I made this ridiculous list. And I think one of the things on the list was consider chain guard images but uh, so many of the things were like turn on a uh, pull request uh, review requirements in your repos so that right. someone else has to, you can't just cheat and yeah. say, well, I'm an admin, I'm just gonna approve my own PR. Right. Like there's just so many little things in there, uh, you know, yep. turning on code QL or whatever your mm -hmm. code scanner is on your Git, Git management tool of yep. choice. And there's just a thousand little things. And I feel like, Chain Guard has finally got. We've you know we we're not early days with your images anymore. In fact, one of the things I wanted to do on this we may not have time for. Maybe if we've got five minutes at the end, maybe we can pull it off. Is I've got my own demo apps that Docker actually made years ago called the Voting App, and I wanted to see how easy it would be to just swap out the official Docker images for the Chain Guard images and. W w can't, would this build? I guess that would be the, the name of that that part of the show. Will there's actually an easier. There's actually an easier intro that I try to recommend to people. That even messing with your Docker files. Um, if you look at the image uh, directory that we have, um, it's it's stuff like Python, Node, Go. Like your sample app is probably going to be mm -hmm. based on. Uh, but what we also have is uh, you, you talked about KubeCon a couple weeks ago. You've probably seen that CNCF landscape diagram. Yes. Um, pretty much every one of those has a Helm chart inside of it, and that Helm chart has like five or six other random images, um, and those are based on yes. all sorts of stuff, and you don't know if they're maintained or not and there's a lot of work that yeah. goes in there um we have almost all those helm charts too and we have drop-in replacements for those um Ooh. and like we test those helm charts for compatibility and if you just want to make some cvs disappear you can like there's documentation for almost all those about which helm charts they correspond to and which values flags to set and you can just swap a chart over and make no changes to your application you still get the same running app and all those cvs are now gone whoa okay 
So that's this is in like Docs? Prometheus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's the stuff that like Prometheus, awesome. like uh, Istio, all those sidecars, all those other things that you're grabbing. Yeah. All right, where am I? And and the, and those uh, the CNCF landscape tools, those open source projects are kind of like the critical components of of your Kubernetes cluster, right? And yeah. so they're yeah, running it's the, as daemon the sets across like. Exactly. Yeah, you, you might have five containers that your team has built, but then there's 13 Helm charts, which turns into 70 containers, and yeah, there's way and more those, under your app than you think. <laughs> and those typically have um, uh, potentially more privileges in the cluster, right, on the Kubernetes API to do things like look at yeah. what what events are going on, all that stuff, right? So yeah. uh, that's a big surface area of potential attack. Um, one thing before we close out on the five things that you mentioned, it seems like it has... Not only I doing those four. Oh, four, four or five things, um, it ruined it. Those also have to be married. With, well, maybe the fifth thing is, uh, and this is what you just kind of mentioned, Brett, is that there's a cultural aspect, right? So there, you have to tie this with like practices that you and muscle memory that, that as an organization you also exercise, and you don't yeah. short circuit um, what the tooling is helping you do uh, by just like. Uh, you know, fast forwarding through deployments, not doing code reviews, and also exercising um, better security hygiene in terms of of delivering uh, these packages and these images um, uh, through your you know your CI/CD processes. But it has to be kind of both. It's not just like don't just rely on the tooling, don't just rely on like something like ChainGuard, but it has to be married with um, some tangible cultural muscle memory around using them properly. Yeah, it's constant because, yeah, somebody's always updating a Helm chart or throwing a new one in. And yeah, it's it, it's constant. You have to think about this stuff. You have to think about your supply chain. So yeah, I, I'm optimistic that at least this uh, incident over the weekend is going to make people think about it a little bit harder over the next year. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Real quick, getting um, back to... Oh, well, sorry, but before we get to questions, <laughs> I just want to I want to round out that whole... He threw out the helm thing, which oh, yes. I'm like, oh, I want to, I want to get people this information. Where do we go? Where do we go for that? Oh man, Eric's here in the chat. Eric, could you pull up a sample one? <laughs> yeah, I was wondering I if it was in docs or if it was a GitHub or I, it, uh, anyway. there's the GitHub repo, but yeah, it gets mirrored into the docs. Uh, I'd, I'd probably right. just like start looking for Prometheus and see what the instructions are there on one of those images. Um, uh, yeah, Eric will find it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Eric, Eric's like, you, wait, Eric. what? We were talking about you. Uh, Eric, uh, Helm charts for, yeah. describe it to him, Dan, sorry. Yeah, so Eric, uh, in a lot of our image docs, we have like the, the instructions on how to use one of the upstream Helm charts uh, with like the dash dash values equal to swap out the image repo and image tag stars. Could, sorry for calling on you. <laughs> it's not our own Helm charts. We basically just let you use the existing right. Helm charts and swap in the images. Yeah, that's and awesome. That, and that's a really important distinction too, because right. I, I think yes. I would have honestly, I would have, I, if I would have approached a client's project where they're like, we want to test chain guard images, but we use a lot of, of hubs or uh, sorry, Helm charts because we're using, you know, we have a Postgres cluster and we have a Redis mirror over here and we were using you know, Prometheus and we don't necessarily create our own proper Helm charts and we might pin versions, but we're usually just focusing on the Helm chart version. But it's a great yeah. point that that's the whole point of Helm. It's a templating system. And why not? Why not basically figure out a way to override these so that you don't have to, you don't essentially have to downstream rebuild every single image with a chain guard uh, as its base uh, if chain guard's already doing that for you. So that's pretty cool. I'm sure Eric yeah. Eric says, just a sec, he'll be there. All right. Uh, <laughs> by the way, we have some questions and also a new uh, a new member. Where's this, where's this at? Muhammad, where are you at? Uh, Muhammad Ali... Just became a member. Thank you for being. For, thank you for that. You get a reggae, reggae horn. Uh, thanks for being a, becoming a member. By the way, high fivers. Shameless, selfless, self plug. They're not selfless. Shameless plug. Uh, you can come every month and be a part of our high fivers, which is just a bunch of DevOps people hanging out. So if you're high fiver on this channel, you can get exclusive benefits in our Discord, and then you get to hang out with us monthly. And we basically do this, but we learn from other people working on DevOps stuff, and it's just a water cooler kind of yes. vibe. It's a lot of fun. Um, maybe Dan will hang out, and we'll and we'll and we'll be here so long talking about all this security stuff that we'll end up in the next high fivers, which I think is a few weeks away. Uh, we might still be live streaming once we get done with all this stuff. Um, so um, yeah, Eric found of one of the links. Uh, he dropped that one in for Cert oh. Manager, and um, that's a great yes. example. If you click on that and click the Overview tab, 
um, and scroll down, it shows how to use it with Helm. And yeah, the cert manager is actually like five different images. And so you've got to set five different flags in that one Helm chart, uh, but it's all right there. You can copy paste it. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. <laughs> yeah. Thank so you. Brett, can you pull up the uh, the Academy link? I, I believe you, you were just pulling that up. So Dan, you mentioned a lot of good advice, uh, guidance mm -hmm. uh, for folks to, uh, you know, do, do better with respect to uh, software supply chain, adopting chain guard, understanding these terms. You know, these are just based on this XZ. These are complex systems, complex uh, dependencies. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about this chain guard Academy? Um, yeah, it's, it's a bunch of resources. We have our docs for the product stuff in there too, but we also have stuff like courses and best practices. We, uh, we actually just launched a, a CVE, uh, course where you can get a little badge and take that on LinkedIn, um, and Ooh. post that you're, you're certified at CVE remediation and containers. Oh, that's the one you found here. Yeah. Chain guard courses, software vulnerability, painless vulnerability management. Oh, that looks like me too. Oh, fun. Um, different hat <laughs> that day. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's a great course. It's a couple hours. Uh, hundreds of people have signed up, gone through it. You get a little badge, um, but it kind of breaks down those same kind of things I talked about early on. Minimization, paying attention to what you're using, scanning the right stuff. And then I think there is a final exercise at the end of converting a couple of things over to a chain guard image. Oh, cool. might need to check that out. Um, yeah. All right. Normal. Did you have? Did you want to list some questions? Uh, you you seem like you wanted to. So we've got that. We've got the academy. We should send that to everybody. Yeah. Get them the um, I just I just put that link in for the academy. Um, oh, oops. We've got uh, what questions do we have? Um, so folks, get your questions in. Oh, is there a real time on access antivirus malware scanner for running containers in K8s? Dan, do you want to take that or? Uh... There's a, um, yeah, so there, there's a couple angles there. There's there's a bunch of runtime tools that will detect like known CVEs and do that kind of scanning. There's a bunch of like those great eBPF tools to look for like exploited stuff um, and mm -hmm. stuff like that is really what would have helped you catch an exploit from this SSH attack because there's all these filters that you can set up to flag on. Hey, why is this container sending traffic out of the network or accepting incoming connections when I wouldn't expect it to or, you know, looking up my private keys when it shouldn't. Um, so those are kind of like the runtime protection tools. Um, for antivirus, anti-malware stuff, um, yeah, there's a lot there too. There, there's stuff like Virus Total is this great community database where people have actually uploaded a ton of like Yara rules and other filters to look for known malware um, to make sure you're not running anything that with like signature detection based on like what malware happens to look like. Um, I think there's some Helm charts for Virus Total to get that running against your, your active containers. Mm -hmm. Um, that's really the most useful for stuff like proprietary software, where you don't know if there are CVs or not because no one's running it and you don't know what's in there. Um, but yeah, the eBPF stuff plus CV scanning is the best for the open source things that I've seen. Cool. Yeah, I don't um, actually know if Trivi scans real time Kubernetes. It does have a Kubernetes scanner, but I thought it was more about config. Um, I thought there was an operator somebody put together where it would scan yeah. all the images. It might not be part of the official Trivi project. <laughs> I'm wearing the Falco jacket, which is also another tool oh, nice. we talk a lot about. Yes. We've had on the yeah. show talking about. Um, oh, I, lo yeah. I love some of the stuff that Falco can do. It doesn't. It's not. I wouldn't even call it anything close to an antivirus or CVE scan or anything like that. Like, like Dan's mentioning, it 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 looks for bad behavior and it has a set of excellent rules that watch for bad yeah. behavior on the entire system, specifically around uh, containers. It, it, it's a container aware, so it will think, do things like. Find out if you're doing a, an exec or you're starting a shell in a container, which is yeah. probably in production, not a normal thing. So right. it will look for habits like that. And they have a set of default templates, which is my, my whole big thing is most of the time when people are getting into this, if it's a scanner or if it's a tool like this and there aren't a default, default set of list of rules, like you, you're kind of lost because you're, you're not an expert in all this stuff. So how could you possibly know the things you yep. should be looking for? Uh, it would be like having an antivirus scanner without the actual definition database. So it would be, yeah. it would be impossible to use. Um, yeah, and I'm sure they cranked out Falco rules for the SSH backdoor. I think you just dropped one yeah. in here. But yeah, yes. you could have already had that stuff up and running. You might have had the vulnerable SSH server. Um, but if you had set up rules ahead of time, you probably would have noticed if somebody logged in and started doing stuff, even though it was exploitable. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that. Don't run, don't run SSH in your containers if you don't have to. Please. Don't run please, it anywhere please. if you don't have to. Yeah, that applies there to all go. software. Just don't run it. <laughs> <laughs> the safest software. Um, boom, boom, boom. What so about... Uh, another... oh, okay, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the next one, uh, Constantine uh, asks, what about Google distro lists uh, oh, yeah. worth using? Is it really secure? 
Yeah, I think I was the first commit to that repo. If you look up the license file like eight years ago or whenever that happened, um, I used to work at Google. Yeah. Uh, was my it co-founder, really you, but... Dan? Was it really you? <laughs> I, I, I wasn't signing my commits back then, so you'll have yeah. to just uh, take my word for it. Um, Rogue yeah. Agent. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it's a great project. You know, we, we started trying to deal with CVE stuff. My co-founder, Matt, and I forever ago before anybody else cared about CVEs and containers. And we went with the first approach, which is minimization. Um, and so mm -hmm. a lot of people were building full operating system style containers because that was an easy on-ramp. Um, but Debian pulls in all sorts of stuff, including like kernel related packages and stuff that's not in there. So it caused a lot of noise. Um, and so we set up that project with a bunch of Bazel rules, a terrible decision. I wouldn't recommend that again. Um, but uh, using Bazel rules to like strip down Debian packages and only include what you need and then stitch together containers uh, based on the minimum set. And when you're doing that, you don't even need a shell in a lot of these. So it's hard to do it with a typical Docker file. It's gotten a little easier with multi-stage builds now. But back then you just had a single Docker file. And if you could, if there was no shell in package manager, you couldn't do anything, but we didn't want a shell or package manager manager in our images. So we were doing like tar file surgery and stuff like that to crank out a bunch of images. Yeah. Um, and it's a great start, but you're kind of limited to by what's in the Debian distro. Um, you can't yeah. easily go add new packages that Debian doesn't ship. If you want a newer version of Python or an older version mm -hmm. of something like that, you're stuck. Um, <clears throat> so when we started the company, we decided to take it a level deeper and put a distro back into distro list where we would build our own distro that had all of the packages yeah. we wanted, but then still use distro list containers in the end. Um, so it's an undistro, undistro list, distro for distro list. I don't, uh, there's a bunch of different flavors to it. Uh, yeah, it's a great project. The team still that maintains like, it. Um, that sounds yeah. like an excellent domain name. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah, and they've done a bunch of work on like the salsa hardening, which I know you want to come back to, and signing those containers and everything, and the reproducible builds. It takes forever to strip out timestamps from everywhere, but yeah. Um, it's uh, it's just somewhat limited in nature, and you really, uh, through no fault of that project, you just have to go a lot deeper and spend a lot more time and years adding packages to really catch up to to that and get beyond it. Cool. Yeah. Speaking. Oh, sorry. Normal. You sound like you have one more thing. I was just going to move on to the next question, but that was a great answer. Go for it, Brett. Um, well, well, let's let's get to that because that's Martin's question, I think. Right? Is yes. is there a chain guard solution for build packs? Yeah. Um, yeah, you can, a lot of folks use our images with build packs uh, for their applications. If you use those, they kind of set the base. They put in like that rebase ability and stuff like that. It's really common for like the language level runtimes. Um, so you can use them as uh, replacements for that kind of base layer in build packs. So you just pick the right base image that has some of the stuff you want in there and you can build pack all you want on top of it. Cool. Short and sweet. Um, yes. SLSA, let's jump into that because oh, I know sure. we're, yeah. we're, we're running out of time, yeah. but I want to give people more to do, more work. That's why you sure. all come here, right? You come to learn and then also to get assignments to take home. And I, I feel like I kind of cheated when I did, when I started talking more on a mm -hmm. security mm -hmm. area that I'm not claiming I'm an expert at. I just, sure. I've been dealing with this stuff for a long time. So it's it's one of those things where you, sort of the wisdom of time has given me the awareness that, we can talk about a lot of things, but it really comes when the rubber hits the road yeah. of implementing. How do I know I'm implementing that, that? You know, you gave five things or four things. Yeah. I won't. I won't yeah. uh, pick you on. Pick you on that. But I, I've always been looking for security frameworks or security guidance that lets yeah. basically gives me almost a checkbox like yeah. to do list. And I feel like SLSA is one of the better things I've ever seen. That is Thank approachable, you. understandable. Um, so, oops, let's uh, let's talk about this for a minute. We actually talked about this, I think, when when you all were on the show a year and a half ago. But I think that was pre one point oh. Um, we, I think yeah. one point is still the new standard. So, yeah, let's talk about it. Sure. Yeah. So I'll start at super high level and where it came from. And then, yeah, thanks for uh, plugging like the incrementality in that checkbox approach, because that was really where the work went into. Um, when I started at Google, uh, it was like 2012 or 2013. And that was the same time frame as like those nation state attacks. We kind of come full circle now when we talk about XE. But when all the big tech companies uh, got hit with like the Operation Aurora stuff, it was just in the news this week, too, with like the CSRB and Microsoft and the breach they had last year. But all the tech companies sort of got hit at the same time in 2012 or 2013 when uh, a bunch of the nation states realized that instead of trying to break in from the outside, they could just have people go get jobs at the companies and then do whatever they wanted. Um, and this mm -hmm. is back in the time when like developers just had root access and SSH and prod because that's how you deployed stuff and you SCP yeah. stuff over and FTP servers. And if you had to debug, you just jumped in and attached a tracer or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a kind of terrifying realization um, when you realize that... Uh, 
people probably, when you have 10,000 engineers at the company, there's probably 10 or 12 of them that are spies for some other country doing bad things. Um, and there's no real way to, to prevent that. So the real protection that Google kind of put into place to summarize quickly um, is multi-party review for everything. Um, no one can do anything without someone else signing off on that. Pretty simple when you put it that way. But when you start applying that transitively to anything that could have an effect on anything, um, it gets all the way back to the supply chain. It's not just the source code. If, uh, if, if you review the source code, but somebody's maintaining the Jenkins server under their desk, they can do whatever they want to that source code and they can put in whatever they want. So when you apply that to all of the infrastructure, all of the tools, all of the build scripts and everything, um, that's the only protection I know of really uh, to protect against this style attack. And it doesn't even prevent it. It really just raises the bar because now you need two people cooperating or three people, however you want to set that threshold instead of just one bad actor. Um, when you apply that to the open source, you can start with that same principle of how do we do multi-party review for everything. Um, and to do that, it requires securing all of the infrastructure so people can't log in and make changes without those going through audits, making sure that the code is reviewed, making sure that the build system itself is secure and is running repeatable scripts and they're not just curl piping to bash from a URL that somebody might just be able to go and change. Um, and it's a crazy daunting task when you look at the entire open source supply chain. So you can start out with that as like the high level goal, um, what you want to get to, but that's impossible to just jump straight to that step and it's overwhelming and you just kind of get turned off because you don't make progress along the way at all and you don't know where to start. Um, so all of the hard work in Salsa really went into figuring out the uh, what steps can you take that actually get you incremental progress along that way and then explaining those in simple ways. And so that's where the levels come from. Um, that applies to the source management systems, that applies to the build servers, that applies to the way you install packages. Um, in the very end, it's incredibly ambitious. It's very hard to do. Uh, you shouldn't expect to be able to get there easily. <laughs> Um, but you don't have to. You're making gains. You're preventing things at each step of the way. Salsa level one would have been enough to prevent the XZ attack um, if uh, that source binary that was uploaded was tied back to the source code that, or the source disk that was uploaded was tied back to the source code um, that was in the mm -hmm. repo. Um, then the backdoor couldn't have been slipped in there without someone noticing in the Git repo. Um, but there's you know hundreds of other vectors that were exploited there too, and there were other ways the maintainer could have slipped that in. So it's not perfect, but it would have caught that one. Um, or prevented it if that was applied at the project level. Um, also, the maintainer was just merging code by himself, uh, no code review. Um, that's also a requirement in all of these steps. Um, and that's really hard in the open source context because you might not have someone to review your code or you don't know whose code is coming in. Um, so it's pretty hard, uh, but you can apply this to open source or any way that you're deploying containerized applications inside of your infrastructure. We really wanted this to be something that you could do at scale and make progress, like get everything to level zero and then get everything to level one next year and then pick some of the critical ones and move those to level two next. Um, it's a huge team that worked on this. Um, I was involved a little bit at the beginning, but no, a huge amount of work from almost uh, the entire community and CNCF and OpenSSF went into making sure that these things were lined up in the right boxes. Very cool. Um, I think at uh, some of the different Sorry. conferences, there have been um, presentations around how to implement different levels of, of these yeah. uh, techniques and the salsa levels. Uh, salsa levels, making me hungry here, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> I've got some Chipotle waiting for me after this. So I'm gonna, yeah. I was going to say, <laughs> is, there, is there a Scoville uh, in here that yes. I, could, I should look at? Um, there was a tool just, actually somebody made to try to like assess salsa levels and we called it Scoville. So oh, there we go. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Um, <laughs> so for people, for people out there yeah, real quick, I just wanted to, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So, um, uh, we'll, we'll find some links and put them in the chat and okay. maybe, uh, in the comments of the show around, uh, some guidance around like this framework and also like how to even incrementally mm -hmm. <laughs> start to implement yeah. this in their own organization. Um, yeah. this is top of mind and for all, a lot of CISOs, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really just, the hard work that comes next, because like I said, it's a lot. Sorry, we, we all keep cutting you off, Brett. <laughs> I'll let you no, it's, fine. But it's really, really hard to do this. And it's a huge investment if we try to do this everywhere. Um, but that's mm -hmm. not for any particular reason other than the tools don't exist yet. Um, and that's what mm -hmm. I'm excited about. And that's, you know, really uh, motivational for me. There's no reason the secure way has to be the hard way. Um, and now that this is out there, we've agreed on it. Uh, we're seeing, like you said, all these CNCF tools and presentations making it easier to do that. Until that the easy way, or until the easy default way is the secure way, um, we're gonna have continue to have these problems. Yeah. yeah. All right, okay, a couple quick questions on this. Well, first off, I wanna, I wanna be, I just now realized, because I haven't actually read the 1.0 stuff oh, yeah. that's, the site's significantly yeah. more than it was a year ago. Yeah. Um, and originally, I, I'm, I love this note here because I was confused. Originally, yeah. the SLSA was a, a set of levels, but there was no tracks. So now we have tracks and levels. 
and the tracks, I guess, are like there's build. So people, so in other words, areas of concern, I guess, are the tracks. So if I'm a build engineer, I'm gonna be looking at these build levels. And I love the idea of levels, like rank, I mean, yeah. I mean, there's a there's a thing that we I used to say men die for points. Like we we all love we all love winning more points. And I feel like going up the levels. Like I'm in level zero, and then I've done nothing, and now I've I've got providence in there. I've got a few other things that I can check off a list, and now I'm level one, and I get some sort of badge. And then uh, so of course now we need badges. So if you can go solve that problem, I need security badges on all my repos. But I I I love that this this wasn't a one and done thing, or it wasn't like a gigantic. Like if this if the NSA did this, it would be a 300 page PDF that I, I was either compliant or not, and there was a binary decision. And where this actually, I, I love that there's maturity levels, so that I may not need to go all the way to level three if I'm a small open source project and not a lot of people are using me. But I was curious uh, because we're all involved with the C, uh, CNCF, uh, the the cloud native community. We have this thing around projects that go into the CNCF, and they're sort of fostering. St- open source in terms of stability and maturity and all these different metrics that qualify as projects go from sandbox to these graduated projects that we all know like Kubernetes. I was curious, is SLSA or Salsa, I keep using the acronym, but is Salsa integrated into those? Uh, have you been successful in like convincing the, the CNCF to sort of say, you can't really graduate until you've got some of these SLSA, Salsa, sorry, Salsa levels built into your project? Um, a lot of projects have done it. Um, like I don't, okay. the CNCF doesn't really take a stance where they mandate this stuff. Okay. You know, and for graduation projects, don't even need to produce builds. Uh, you know, but it's encouraged. And Tag Security helps projects, and there's a bunch of grant programs to help if people want to go do this for their work. Um, some of the other foundations, uh, like the Eclipse Foundation, for example, has a, a central build and release team that does all of that for mm. all of the Eclipse projects. They did salsa across the board for all of those. Um, Python is uh, the Python community is moving towards salsa support when you upload stuff to PIP to close that gap I talked about in the beginning. Um, mm-hmm. GitHub did a huge thing integrating GitHub Actions and other CI platforms with NPM, so you can get a little badge if your package was built in one of these Salsa environments before it was uploaded. Um, so yeah, across the board, uh, it's, it seems to be taking off in the open source community. Yeah, very That's cool. That's great. I, th- I think this week uh, with the XC, like this is yeah. going to be top of mind and a conversation yeah. <laughs> that yeah. everyone's having. And, and yeah. it's great to see a framework that so if you don't have anything out there, there's uh, there's salsa. There's also um, you know there's, it borrows there's those from three hundred page ones from this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah there's uh, uh, from you know I've, I've got to plug AWS a little bit, but you know we have the well architected review yeah. where the security pillar has some of this governance and and um, references the uh, the salsa f- uh, framework as well in yeah. some of the uh, governance around artifact builds um, and 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 uh, the areas that this framework addresses so um, it, there is hope right so don't, don't yeah. think if you're out there and you're you're starting to get questioned about hey like would this happen in our org like will yeah. XE like like there are things that you can start yeah. to adopt and look at to kind of tackle that yeah isn't there real quick isn't there like a, a badge like it's like a duck or something with a shield on it? You can yeah, play. the goose. Yeah, yeah, the goose is a goose. Yeah, what, yeah the open what SSF's is mascot is a goose. Um, open, yes. And then yeah, the they, they kind of do themed logos for some of these projects. So yeah, there's a salsa goose. <laughs> nice. Uh, All right. I, I so, remember I put that in my talk, and, and I yeah. needed to look that up. Um, sorry, what were you gonna say? Yeah. So Dan, um, we're we're kind of rounding out the the hour here. Um, yeah. We've we've flown through a lot of content. What's what's kind of uh, what's coming up for chain guard what's what are what should folks look forward to more and more and more images we're trying to support more workloads we're, we've caught up as hard as it is to catch up with the cncf landscape because it grows every day you know we're, we're getting close to being done with that kind of thing uh we're doing more python stuff now there's all the ai ml is huge there's pytorch yeah. mm-hmm. there's all these other things we're, we're working on that um we've got uh one container up now with some CUDA libraries in there too so we're, we're working mm-hmm. on expanding that one because those those containers are like 35 50 gigabytes sometimes mm-hmm. they're huge when you're trying to run these ml workloads uh so yeah just more and more and more software and more CVs patched. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Um, and where can folks get started? Where, what's a good entry point for ChainGuard? Uh, images.chainguard.dev. Uh, that's the, the entry point to all the sure. software we've got. Yeah. 
cool. All right. And yeah, and yeah. you've got your own website now for the images, which uh, was, yeah. was also something that happened in the last year and a half, was was actually having a, a whole, yeah. like, your own little Docker Hub GitHub light. Repo. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It used to be a GitHub. But uh, this is all great stuff. And I think that um, I, I owe the internet a video of me trying to convert some of my own stuff into chain guard images uh, because we didn't get into the nuances, but you know, most things just work, but it depends on what you're, like you mentioned, you talked about people that might have been using apt or yum before. Like there's, there's some, there's some work yeah. there. If you're not, if you're not mm -hmm. using something like NPM or go, yeah. uh, packages, stuff like that. And I wanted to sort of have a video where we kind of dove into that, but you know, we had to have this whole XZ problem that would take up the hour. <laughs> Who knew that that was going to ruin our day and next time. Yeah, yeah next, time. next time it'll be the WI package. Yeah. <laughs> and we do have these learning labs we do monthly where we pick specific types of applications ooh, and run ooh. through how people can convert those. I think the next one we're doing is PHP. Um, yeah, we can uh, post some links for that too uh, if you want to sure. watch how to convert specific stuff because each one is yeah. a special snowflake. <laughs> yeah, there's <Yes>. actually, <laughs> I think I have it up. This is this is what we're talking yeah. about. The Yeah. Uh, or maybe not. Oh, no, different one. Different one. You got? Do you have like a, an There's events so list things. somewhere? Maybe. maybe. <laughs> I find. Do out you know your before. own website? Oh, events. Hey, look at that. Okay. Okay. We're gonna put events oh, that's up there. The only one you see. There's definitely a learning labs PHP thing coming soon. But yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> All, good. All right. Ask Dan on Twitter. Uh, he's on Twitter. I see him on LinkedIn all the time, posting excellent content. So if you're someone on LinkedIn or X, like chain guard people are there. Uh, they've also got yes. multiple Docker captains working for them. I see you, Eric. Um, and so th there's just a lot of energy that at, around the company. The booth had a lot of energy at KubeCon. Uh, I had multiple conversations around all the stuff y'all are doing. And of course the big Docker hub announcement, that was a big deal. And I'm just glad to have you back on the show. Of course, now this is a precedent. Every time there's a major, every week that there's a CVE, oh gee, if only there was just one CVE a week. Um, we, we need Dan back on the show to break it down for us. So uh, we we really appreciate it. And thank you so much for taking time. We actually, would you all didn't see this before the show. Dan was ru not literally running, but running on the internet to get, to get here on time because he's been in a bunch of meetings all talking about these this new vulnerability and that just what happened and breaking down and talking to all sorts of official people in the United States. Like it's a big deal. He's a big yes. deal. So we're just glad to have you here uh, to give sort of the, the layman's uh, definition of what's really going on behind the scenes here. So thank you for being here. Yep. Thanks for having me. Yeah. All right, everybody. Chainguard.dev. Go check it out. They're on Docker Hub. They're everywhere. And we're going to obviously talk more about Chainguard like we do all the time. So come back often for the live show. Uh, you can find Dan and Chainguard on LinkedIn as well as on Twitter. I'm sure they're everywhere else as well. I'm just not everywhere myself, so I don't even know if you're on TikTok. But um, <laughs> someone's talking about you on TikTok. I'm sure. I'm sure it's there. I used to be. Yeah, I deleted it a couple of years ago. It was taking too much time. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't yeah. stop scrolling. <laughs> I know, I know. I've, I'm. I don't open the app anymore. I'm scared of it. It scares me. Um, well, for you all on the on, next week on the show, we're actually we've got a ton of stuff coming out of KubeCon. Uh, Dan isn't the only big heavy hitter showing up on the show, and I'm gonna have to go to the list because we keep um, we keep booking <laughs> more people. So coming up, we've got we're gonna talk about Docker Slim, which is weirdly on topic for this because another way to analyze your containers. The, it's not called the Docker Slim project. It's not called Slim Toolkit. So we're going to have them on the show. We've got Zoho talking about monitoring Kubernetes, the site 24 seven people, mm -hmm. they were at KubeCon. We have Jasper on the show next week. We're gonna talk all about the most popular Kubernetes metrics for monitoring, what they see people doing on Kubernetes monitoring and alerting, and we're gonna get into it. So if you're someone who's dealing with operations in Kubernetes, and you're maybe you're a Prometheus person, person, or maybe you're considering some of the SaaS's out there, that's going to be next week. We got Matt Williams on a llama talking about Gen AI. We're going to have a llama mm -hmm. on the show. Matt's uh, an expert. He's got his whole channel dedicated to Olama now here on YouTube. We've got oh, Nermals coming on uh, on the CNDO Q and A in three weeks. I'm just reading down the list. Yes, We've got a we lot going on. Q and A's. Yes, we have, we have Q and A's, so you can come back and ask us questions. Subscribe to the like, newsletter, then you'll find out what the next show is about. <laughs> We're so good at wrapping up on this show. We are a, we are a finely tuned machine is what we are. Um, yes, so, we are, Brett. 
Thank you, everyone, for being here. Kyle is actually jumping in the chat. Min Toolkit is the new name for Dr. Slim. So he's going to be on the show here soon. We don't even have a date yet, but soon is my new term for everything in the future. But yeah, get on the cool. newsletter. We'll see you all next week, everybody. Ciao. Thank you all. Have a great one. Thanks, Dan.